The big idea behind cryptography in general is to be able to send secure messages so that even if that message happens to be intercepted, it still needs to be decrypted, meaning it still needs to be somehow reverted back to the original message. So it's like if you were to put a note and write something on it and then stick it in a box and put a lock on that box and you're the only one with the key. So somebody could actually receive that box from you and you send a friend that box and say, hey, put your secret message in here and then lock it with this lock. So the friend puts that message in the box, puts the lock on, he doesn't have the key and now ships it back to you physically. You're the only one with the key, so you're the only one that could, in theory, unlock it. Now, of course, in that context, somebody could grab a hammer, a pair of bolt cutters, and eventually maybe cut the lock off and be able to access the contents of the box. But that's where the idea of hacking comes in. In the context of actually sending data, imagine that we have two people. Maybe we'll call this person Ann, and we'll call this person Bill. And Anne wants to send some sort of message to Bill. Perhaps Anne is using Bill's website and is going to enter her credit card number or some sort of uh, financial information to send over to Bill so that Bill's bank could then process the payment and Bill could then ship out the product. So in order for Anne to send the message, let's suppose that we call her message P. Okay, so we, we often call this P because P stands for plain text. And all a plain text value is, uh, is the original message. Okay, original message. In the scope of cryptography, that's going to be a, a set of values. For now, let's just pretend this is one value. So what's going to have to happen is before this gets shipped over, there's going to have to be a conversion. So we're actually going to convert this plain text value into what we call a cipher. And a cipher is the encrypted value, the encrypted message. So there has to be some sort of function sitting there that's going to convert that value into something that is unreadable only if you have the ability to unlock that. So Anne is going to take this plain text value and it's going to be converted into that cipher. And that cipher value is going to be some function involving the plain text value as well as what we call a public key. So we're going to have, in our case, a value of N and a value of E. And N is called the We'll say n is defined to be the public key. And just like the phrase emphasizes, it's a key that sort of locks the message, but it's public. Anybody can lock the message. Anybody can lock the box. And this value of e, as we'll soon learn, e is what is called an encryption exponent. So that's defined to be an encryption exponent. And once Bill receives the message, Bill is going to receive the value of C. Now that's not going to do Bill much good because Bill doesn't know what that means. It's a, a jumbled up series of numbers that do not reflect the original message that Anne had sent. So what Bill is going to have to do is he is going to have to apply some sort of function, which we'll, we will call F inverse. And remember, this just means that it's not f to the negative 1, it's just it's going to undo what f did. So he is going to have to input that cipher text value, as well as two other values, one of which is called b, and we'll define that in a second, and the other that is called d. Okay, now c, we already know is the cipher text. b is what we call, defined to be the private key. Okay, so Anne had the ability to lock the box, but Bill is the only one that can unlock the box. And the value of D is actually called the decryption exponent because it will undo what the encryption exponent has done. 
Now, one thing that we know about functions is that, oh, and this will produce, this will produce the value of, of P. So this will allow Bill to achieve the value of P. So if, from what we know about functions, if we, if we want to compute P, P is equal to the inverse, uh, an inverse function involving C. Now I'm going to omit the B and D because these are just some constant values. It's P and C that are really considered the input and output, like the X and the Y in a function. So if I apply or if I take uh, the, the inverse of C, I get P. But if I take F of P, we know that that gives us the value of C. And then if I take the inverse of that, the inverse of that, that allows me to achieve the value of P again. So as a simple example, if I were to give you a function like F of X equals uh, 2X plus 1, if this were the actual encryption algorithm, and rather than, I guess, rather than using X, we'll use P in here. And we'll say that this is 2P plus 1. And your plain text value is, say, 6. Then F of 6 is going to be 2 times 6, which is 12 plus 1, which is 13. And that would be the ciphertext. Now, if you received 13 and you wanted to obtain the original value of P, how would we go about doing that? Well, we would have to have an inverse function. So an inverse function, and once again, I'll just replace this right here because that's the same thing as saying C is equal to 2P plus 1. So all I would really have to do is solve this equation for P. So I would subtract 1, I would divide by 2, subtract 1, divide by 2, and that would give me the value of P. So this, this is another way of saying that F inverse of the C value, which is C minus 1 over 2, will allow me to obtain the value of P. So back here we said C is equal to 13 based upon this encryption function. And if, I, if, if now Bill received C equals 13 and wanted to obtain the original value that Ann had sent, he would take the F inverse function, plug in 13, which would give him 13 minus 1 over 2, which is 12 divided by 2, which is 6. And we do indeed see that that is the original message that was sent. So this encryption algorithm, it's, that's really what it is. It's what we call a one-to-one -one function, meaning that for every input, there is a unique output. In other words, it would be very tricky if I took one message and each time I encrypted it, it became something different. It should always became, become the same encrypted message. And similarly, once you receive that encrypted message to decrypt it, to undo it, you should always end up with a unique original input value or an original plain text value. Because again, it would be problematic if Bill took C equals 13, plugged it into his function, came up with P equals 6, one time, P equals 12 another time, P equals 14 another time, we would never be able to successfully transmit data. Now therein also lies the problem because if you know what the encryption algorithm is, a lot of times you can hack or figure out what the decryption algorithm is. You may have heard the phrase trapdoor before, uh, and what we call uh, this encryption algorithm that we're about to study is called a trapdoor. And in this case, the trapdoor is actually the private key. Because without the private key, you can't obtain the decryption exp exponent. And if you can't obtain the decryption exponent, you cannot decrypt the message. So in the next video, we'll take a look at the algorithm itself and how these functions are defined.